This is Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. I'm Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College of Business and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. My guest today is Associate Justice Will Sellers of the Alabama Supreme Court. He's a graduate of Hillsdale College, the University of Alabama Law School, and NYU Law School where he earned an LLM. He has been on the Alabama Supreme Court since 2017. Justice Sellers, welcome to the show. Thanks, glad to be here, Al. Appreciate you, you are, having me. Uh, you're, you're born and raised right here in Montgomery. I have lived in Montgomery all my life except for my higher education. Uh, I left Alabama and then went to Hillsdale in Michigan for about four years and I about froze to death, so I came back home to try to at least thaw out, so. <laughs> well, tell me how uh, Montgomery has changed since your childhood here. Oh gosh, Montgomery is a completely different, I mean, it's not even, I mean, <laughs> there are places that you go through now that aren't, you know, they've, they've, they've been two or three different things since then. Now, Montgomery's really changed for the, for the better. I mean, it's, um, we had great leadership when I was a teenager under Emory Farmer, and Emory Farmer ran this city like nobody's business. He was the guy that was on top of everything and all that, but Emory set the stage for a lot of very positive things. Um, and then the economic development things that, that Todd Strange uh, brought on board. I mean, some of the things, the downtown revitalization. I mean, my father's office was downtown, and I can remember for a time that if you were downtown on a weekend, there was nobody here. You come downtown Montgomery on a, on a weekend, you'll see people walking their dogs, young children. There's a lot of activity down here from the stuff on the riverfront to the baseball and the amphitheater and some other great plans that are going on. I mean, now the water park. I mean, they're, they're, Montgomery is, is really moving in the right direction. And, and you probably saw the news, but I mean, Hyundai continues to uh, invest money here, another $250 million, more folks getting employed. And, you know, you, railroad companies are looking at us as a, as a hub for different things because we got stuff going on in the port, but we can ship things to Montgomery. So there are a lot of positive things going on. So it's changed a lot uh, in the 60 years that I've, that I've been a member of this wonderful community. My family and I love going to the Biscuits games. That's just one of our fun things to sure. do in the summer, those evening games in particular, because it gets awful hot over down yeah, here. Yeah. You, want, you want to go like in <laughs> May or kind of toward the end of it, because you go to a, a, you know, a, a game during lunchtime in June or whatever it is, and if you don't have suntan lotion, you can really hurt <laughs> yourself. Well, Hillsdale College is a place that's near and dear to my heart. I've spent a lot of time up there. But it was probably a different place in the 80s when you, when you were there. It probably looked different. I know it had some different buildings. Yep. What was your experience like when you went to Hillsdale? Well, Hillsdale in the 80s was a magical place. I mean, I graduated from high school in 81. So Ronald Reagan had just been inaugurated president. Um, he had survived the John Hinckley shooting. And Hillsdale was just on everybody's radar screen for the conservative movement. I mean, the people that came in and out of there the four years that I was there, I, I get lost in the list of some of the conservative luminaries. I mean, one of my favorite things was, you know, to spend time with people like Russell Kirk. Um, I've got a great picture. Actually, I, there's, a, there's a clip that somebody found of me some years ago that I actually introduced Russell and Annette Kirk for some seminar that we had. Of course, I'd forgotten about it. I ought to Put, I'll find that because it's kind of neat, but um, you know, Bill Buckley came, Ed Fulner came, uh, you know, Stan Evans. I mean, all, all these guys that were, um, you know, you, you, you name them, um, you know, um, just, just a, a lot of people came through there. And as a student, uh, we had uh, the ability to go and hear them speak, but also to have dinner with them or have them teach a class and those kind of things. Like George Nash, George Nash was a frequent, I mean, you know, Murray Rothbaum, I mean, all these very, very well thought of. I don't know that Milton Friedman ever, ever came on campus, but he'd been there before, but it permeated with those kind of, you know, big ideas, you know, really was a highlight of the conservative movement. You know, when Reagan came in in the 80 election, you know, there were like six Senate seats that the Republicans had captured, so they had the Senate. So Reagan was able to do a heck of a lot of stuff. And a lot of those senators and congressmen and think tank leaders they were in and out of Hillsdale routinely and as a as a kid, just to be around them and absorb some of those ideas was very uh, transformational for and me. I, I know you've attended some meetings of the Philadelphia Society. For some reason, I seem to recall that at least one of those was when you were a student. Oh yeah, no, yeah, we used to go. I mean, one of the great things about the Philadelphia Society is when we were students is they had some, you know, knockdown rate for students to go. Now, 
you know, you had to pay for your own room and they stayed in nice places. So, you know, you'd be amazed how many college kids you can, you can put into a room and divide it by six or eight to, to make it all work. But no, we would go to the Philadelphia side. And w when that started, uh, it was only in Chicago. We used to, I was trying to understand. So there's the thing called the Philadelphia Society, but it only meets in Chicago. And then I happened to be in the Philadelphia Society when they actually met in Philadelphia one time. I and mean, this was like, this is either 88 or 89. And everybody remarked about doesn't this make sense that the Philadelphia Society would actually meet in Philadelphia? But going to those meetings was unbelievable. I mean, some of the people that were there and the topics that were there, as, as a young conservative, uh, you really had a lot of incredible ideas that were being batted around. And uh, to, like I said, to absorb all that uh, was an integral part of my, the basis for my, my thoughts, really. Now, did you go straight from Hillsdale to law school I in did. Alabama? So straight into law school. And how did yeah. you know that that was what you wanted to do? Did you... Well, I didn't. I mean, so my, I've never, uh, so, you know, when, you, um, when you're in high school and you meet with the guidance counselor, like 10th or, or 11th grade or, or whatever, and they tell you, you know, you need to have a goal, something that you really want to do, and you need to have this goal that you can write down and put it on a note card in your pocket so when you're thinking about things, you can look at your goal and it will inspire you. I, I, I've never had a goal, and so I, I asked my guidance counselor, I said, can a goal be to have three meals a day? And she said, no, it's not. It's got to be bigger than that. So I'm not a real, I don't have long-term ambitions or goals. I've just sort of been one of those people that there are opportunities that present themselves and you take advantage of them. And so I never really planned on going to law school necessarily. It just seemed to kind of make sense. I majored in history and political economy. And uh, there wasn't a real market for, you know, uh, Bachelor of Arts in, in History and Political Economy unless I wanted to teach, which I wouldn't have mind doing. I enjoy lecturing sometimes, but law school seemed like a, a great option, and coming home to Alabama seemed like an even, an even better option because I enjoyed my time in Michigan. It was The temperature was a little bit uh, difficult for me, so coming to law school in Alabama was a great ticket to get, to get back home and kind of reimmerse myself in, in, in our wonderful state and in the community that I've been a part of all my life. I happen to think that three meals a day is, is a pretty good goal. I actually. thought it was. My guidance <laughs> counselor thought it should be a little bit more weighty. Um, but but I, I still have that goal. If, if, if every night I can go home and before I go to sleep think I've had three meals a day, I'm thankful for that and I feel like I've accomplished something. So all the high-minded things, I've never really been, uh, I've never subscribed to all that. Those can be a distraction sometimes. So yeah, well, the I'm meal, very simple. The meals are my favorite part of the day for sure. Explain the NYU tax piece. Were you practicing before you got that, or did you go straight from law school to get that, and why did you get that? How did, how did yeah, so, that? Yeah, so I went straight through, so really s simply, um, so I got to law school, and I didn't, I don't have any extensive legal background in my family. Most of my family were all business people. My father was an investment banker, and so I grew up in a business environment as much as anything. So the first year of law school, when, you're got, when you have things like torts and civil procedure, I found that to be a challenge because it just seemed, you know, some kind in incongruent some ways and all that. But I could understand things like property because my father developed real estate and I was with him and saw how those things worked. And so the thing that made the biggest difference for me is working at a law firm in the summer. And I was very fortunate uh, in the summer uh, to work for a law firm that had a couple of tax lawyers and they needed somebody to help do some research and all that, and I enjoyed that thoroughly. That seemed to make a whole lot more sense with the business world that I had grown up in, and uh, I, had, I had had a little bit of a, uh, not really a minor, but I think they used to call it an emphasis in business. So I had enough accounting and economics and all that, and so tax law made a lot of sense to me. And then as I got into it, I'm like, this is a lot of fun because you get to litigate against the IRS and the Revenue Department and all these other people that are trying to take money away from hard business folks, and that was a, that was a great deal of fun. So I went straight from law school. Um, Lee and I got married, uh, and then we moved to New York and uh, had a really fabulous education at NYU. I mean, it was, I, I think it probably still is one of the premier, you know, tax programs. And the professors I had, you know, either wrote the book or were involved in all of it. So th the tax program at NYU was, it was transformative in a way too, because I was with people that had been so involved in all that that it gave me a wonderful basis to come back and, and be a tax lawyer and not only do the office practice transactional side, but also do a lot of tax litigation, which I, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So, Well, as the executive director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center, I'm interested in your brief mention there 
of economics. I happen to know you fairly well and know that you have been involved in some law and economics right. seminars, in particular with George Mason University. Sure. They yeah. have the Law and Economics Center. And uh, I'm curious, you know, if you want to talk about that sort of interest that you have, and it's almost an, it's an, almost an academic interest. That well, I mean, it's a practical way to look at stuff. I mean, I think sometimes um, you can look at the law and it can be so academic and so removed from the practical realities of life. And I think economics is one of those things, whether you like it or not or whatever, there are a lot of things that are practical. You know, there are these laws of supply and demand and you may not like them and we may not like the data that they produce, but they're laws for a reason. And they do, and they do work, and they do um, give us some idea. But if you make a change in something, there's going to be a counterbalancing, uh, you know, consequence to that. And so I think law and economics gives you a sense to say, you know, we've got, you know, we got the law that's here, but there's also an economic component to how we view the law and what it does and what the impact is. And so it's probably not a bad thing in training lawyers and training judges, for that matter, to kind of overlay legal principles with economic principles because I think it, you, you get a more practical result of what we're trying to do. I mean, it makes no sense to simply, you know, solve academic problems that aren't really practical. We have real world issues that come before us as lawyers and now as a judge. And so in order to fashion a solution, it helps to have a little bit of an economic background to think through the consequences of actions that are made and, and what some of those uh, economic rules happen to be and how impactful decisions can be if you don't appreciate what uh, economics teaches us about how people respond to incentives or disincentives and things like that. It is astounding to me what the Scalia Law School at George Mason University has accomplished just uh, under Henley Butler most recently, right. but then Henry Manny when right. he sort right. of put, put that law Big Henry and Little that. Henry, as they, <laughs> they say. I think affectionately. I, I wouldn't want to say that to Henry Butler, but... Well, you uh, just said it on Well, camera. I know. Well, he's a great, <laughs> but he's a great guy, and he's been he a is. great leader in all that. And it's just a different way to think about the world, but I think that's a whole lot better than some of, you know, some of the new criticism that comes out, some of the deconstruct... I mean, all these other kind of legal Critical philosophic theories. things and all that. Law and economics tends to be rooted in history and reality, and I think that's probably something that, that lawyers and judges especially need to know about. Well, you had an extensive career in practice and know the practical side, and it was, what, almost 30 years, 28 yeah, years 28 in, in years. private yeah. practice? Yeah. What, what was, um, I mean, I know you did multiple things, but what was, like, the majority of your practice? Was you know, it, it was so, so, as I mentioned, I don't really have any great goals. So um, I like to do a lot of different things. So I had a really fun practice. I mean, I did a lot of industrial uh, development work. I mean, it's fun now to drive by places. And I think, you know, I remember financing that plant and we financed that plant and that added, you know, three or 400 jobs of this, this little community here. You know, I, so I did, I did that kind of work, did some public financing work, but um, did a lot of tax litigation, uh, litigated a lot in tax court and in the, uh, uh, the, the Alabama Tax Tribunal uh, against the Revenue Department. And then the other part is you just have an office practice where people are trying to figure out, you know, here's a small business guy that says, look, I want to do this, but I know the tax consequences could be better or worse depending on if I dot this I or don't cross this T, what's the best way to get from point A to point B and not have to pay Uncle Sam a whole lot. So you had that part of it. And the other thing that, you, that I enjoy doing a lot was, uh, you know, helping uh, business folks with succession planning, estate planning to think, hey, I'm not going to be around for the rest of my life. I've developed a very good business. How do I pass this on to my children and grandchildren so that I don't uh, end up costing uh, my estate a whole lot of money? And so the tax rules are, are really traps a lot of times for the unwary. And when you know the rules, you can advise somebody and say, hey, if you set something up this way, the tax consequence will be minimal. If you don't, they're going to be significant. So let's work out a way to make sure that your business is inherited by people you know, love, and care about and, uh, and, and do some things that way. So I had a fairly diverse practice, but the tax part of it was always, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, that whisper in the background because it does tend to affect how business people uh, conduct their business, how they plan their business, and then, you know, there are tax controversy things where there's a dispute about how do you treat a certain transaction, and I found that to be enjoyable to litigate some of those issues, and I, I enjoy it. I, I enjoyed that thoroughly. I probably miss some of that because that was a lot of fun. You've always been very involved in the community, both with civic organizations, community organizations, 
and uh, you served on the electoral, you're a member of the Electoral College, what, maybe yeah. four? Four times, Four yeah. times, yeah. 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 Have the scars to prove it. Too, so. <laughs> what, uh, what drove you to do that? And I guess because our audience is principally directed at young people, what advice do you have for young people about getting involved and yeah. connecting with the community? Well, I mean, the first thing is I had, gra had great parents, and my parents were very involved in the community, so I don't know that I had a choice. We just did certain things. I mean, I can remember <laughs> as a kid going to different things for my parents and being volunteered or voluntold, more likely, that we were <laughs> going to do this or do that. And so you just get, you, and then you realize it's, it's important that people, that you give back. I mean, my father used to always talk about, you know, you need to pay your civic rent. you got to give back. The community has given us a lot. It's given us a livelihood. It's given us friends, family, um, a wonderful community, and you've got to do your part to make sure the community is stabilized and that we can give that to the next generation. So I, I think, you know, community service isn't a burden. It's really fun because you realize, hey, there are things that we can do to make where we live a better place. And then it's really enlightened self-interest because if the community grows and prospers, well, a rising tide raises all boats. So everybody benefits from that. I don't think you go into fully thinking that you're going to get an indirect benefit, but that's what, that's what happens. And then you, you look at things and think, we really made a difference in some of the things that we did. This particular project for this group really made a difference. It's helped uh, you know, young people. One of the things um, that I got involved in uh, early on, Margaret Carpenter was a wonderful person that was head of the school board. I made the mistake of going to the grocery store to run an errand one, uh, one night and I ran into Margaret. And Margaret was the kind of person that got you hooked in anything. So Margaret was head of the school board and realized that kids that got expelled from school didn't have anything to do. So Margaret said, you're a tax lawyer. I'm going to create this foundation to make sure that kids uh, that get expelled from school have a second chance. So we created the Second Chance Foundation. And that was an organization that went out. And if you'd gotten expelled from school, we gave parents away to keep their kids on grade level. Some of them needed maybe some counseling to help with maybe some emotional issues, maybe some anger issues. And uh, it was very gratifying that when you had a program, and Margaret set it up, and Margaret funded it and hired people, and these kids could go then go apply to be readmitted to the school system. There were a lot of things like that that people did. It was fun to be involved in those kind of things. You could see, hey, here's some tangible results. Here's somebody that got expelled from school. They went through this program, got back in school, and now, you know, they're a, they're a captain in the, in, the, uh, you know, in the Air Force or something like that. So all those community things really do yield great benefits and they, they impact you in ways you don't fully realize. You know, as somebody who's been teaching for quite a while now, it is always interesting when someone reaches out and it may be a student from many years past and they'll say, hey, you really had an impact or, you know, this class meant a lot to me. And sometimes, Quite frankly, you don't even remember who the student was because you've you've taught yep. thousands of students over the years, but uh, that is that is always rewarding to see when your investment, whether it's in time yep. or money, has yielded dividends. Um, I want to ask because I hear sometimes uh, from judges and justices who have transitioned from private practice to the court, and they get up to the court and they can kind of take a deep breath and they realize, oh, sort of the hustle bustle, fast paced life of private practice is over. I'm no longer getting inundated by phone, like with phone calls yeah. and with emails. My office is not, no longer am I just getting 10 emails a second. And, uh, and so the, the pace of the job is a little different. You're able to dig a little deeper into uh, legal principles and obviously into case history and legal doctrine. How was that transition for you? Was it enjoyable? Did you like it? Did you find life on the court to be very different from life as a private practitioner? Yeah, so um, it, it is different. So my, my life on the court started like this, is the governor um, decided to appoint me to the court, and I think that was on um, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. So on whatever day it was, I called some of my law partners and said, look, the governor's going to appoint me to the Supreme Court. It's not something that I had really thought about too deeply or pursued. Um, and so before I knew it, I'd been appointed to the court. And so I had three things. I had to shut down, and it wasn't shutting down my practice. I just had to parcel my work out to other lawyers and get them up to speed on different things that were going on, uh, you know, with particular cases or clients or, or whatever it is. Then you got the work of the court that's going on, and then you have other things that you just got to deal with that you'd been committed to. So the first six months or so, I felt like I was working like three different jobs of trying to make sure things got transitioned right. And I mean, it was not unusual to say, hey, tell us about this 
particular transaction. You know, you'd have to go get back into it to get somebody else up to speed. But once all that transition ended, I f have found the work of the court to be enjoyable. You do have more time to think and more thoroughly consider some legal issues that when you're in private practice, you've got a lot of things going on. Um, you know, there's a judge that's telling you a brief's due a particular time or, but you know, you, you're not always, uh, that your time is not your own. On, on our court, to some degree it is, although I think deciding cases promptly is important, but we do have a chance to think about things, delve into them as you indicate a little bit more thoroughly, and, and write an opinion that we think will not only solve the particular problem the litigants have, but will also serve as maybe a roadmap for people with similar situations. So the work of the court is intellectually challenging and stimulating. The pace is a little bit slower, um, but the things that we do have vast consequences to not only Alabama, but to other states that maybe look at us for different things like that. But it's highly enjoyable, but you're right, I don't get it nearly that many emails. And, and when I was in private practice, I had a number of clients that were in different countries. So it would not be un, unusual to wake up in the morning and have an email from somebody from Korea or India or France or whatever it is trying to, you know, they were doing stuff in Alabama and anyway so you don't have that I don't I don't have to I don't have any clients anymore I think my only client is maybe my colleagues that I feel responsible to to get my work out and review their work in a timely and prompt fashion well I've heard it said that you can tell a lot about a person by the way his or her office is decorated and your office is fascinating it's it's got <laughs> little it's got memorabilia it's got some historical uh, you know you've got antiques you've got you know a lot of significant, um, you know, photographs and it's uh, pieces of history, and you write regular columns for a variety of media outlets in in Alabama. Well, free content. It's amazing how many people will buy free content. So if you give people <laughs> free content, uh, you've got pretty ready market. So well, it's it's not it's not you know typical for judges to write, you know, pieces of history like that. What makes you do that? What what what? What drives you to write those pieces? I've always said you should you should compile those things into a book. By the way, <laughs> well, maybe 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 one of that. I don't have enough time for that. <laughs> so I mean, I think uh, I think one of the things that has distressed me since I got on the court and had more time is when you look around as you talk to people. Sometimes you realize there's a real ignorance of history, and people have an idea that the only history that matters is what happened. 20 years before I was born. And they don't understand that history is much deeper, is much richer, and is not limited to our own personal experience. I think regrettably as Americans sometimes we think that, you know, because we are a superpower, our currency is everybody's reserve currency. And all, we, do, we don't take time to think about their other countries, their other people that have done significant things, and that we can maybe profit by their example. So. I determined, really, it's almost been, it'll be going on four years, I think, I, I, somebody encouraged me and said, you know, well, if you have an idea, you ought to write it. And, uh, and, and, and you know, these, these online news sources, some of the print media, they'll, they'll publish stuff like that. So I started, uh, you know, doing that, and one thing led to another, and now I really am on pace. I try to write an article once a month that is some, the anniversary of some historical event that's maybe people didn't know about, or if they knew about it, they maybe didn't know some nuance and all. And I think it gives people a sense of there's this broad history that's out there, and if we discover it, we might be able to learn something that we didn't know, and we might find, you know, maybe some solace or maybe some encouragement or maybe, um, you know, some motivation that, hey, well, I'm not the only one that has dealt with this. There are other people that lived way before me, and I can look at how they handled a certain situation or how um, something transpired and think, well, that's a, that's a good thing. It's good to know that other people have, have lived through similar times, and so we're not in some unique, this has never happened before. So, Well, your term is up in 2025, so how yeah. soon are you going to start thinking about campaigning and, and, and doing that kind yeah. of thing? I mean, it's got to be on the mind, in the yeah. back of the mind. Yeah, so like, some of it already starts. I mean, qualifying hasn't doesn't open until October. So all you can really do is, is um, you know, go and meet with people, talk to different groups, and, and try to be out there. And then, you know, I do have a day job. And so I try to get our opinions turned around, you know, very quickly. Because I've been on the court for six years, 
it's not a secret what I think or how I view the world or whatever, so it's not like I have to make a case of let me tell you what I think about it. Anybody can go and look at what, uh, you know, the things that, that I've written. But, um, you know, it's, Alabama's unique. I, I had a group of international students in a couple of months ago from Maxwell International Officer School, and they're just amazed that we elect judges in Alabama. And I said, every judge except for municipal judges are all elected in Alabama. Well, other countries don't do that, and people are horrified. At what, but, but it's really a good thing because it forces us to interact with lawyers, to interact with the community, to maybe you know, have people ask us hard questions. Now, some things you can't answer if a qu case is before the court, but it gets you thinking about, well, that's what we ought to do. We're public servants. We shouldn't be afraid of the public to go out and say, here, I'm, I'm, I'm running for, uh, you know, the Supreme Court. Um, here are my credentials. I've done these things. I've written these opinions. You tell me what, what you think about the work that I've done. And if I've done a job that you think was, if, I w if I've been fair, if I've been impartial, if I've provided stability, then I think uh, I'm worth uh, your consideration for uh, re-election and things like that. So I, I think it's enjoyable to interact. And people appreciate it too. I, I've, I've been amazed at some of the places that I go and, you know, some people, you know, have, have never had uh, you know, a judge just sit and have a conversation with them about any number of things that may not even be legal, just about philosophical ideas or historical things and all that. So I, I, I enjoy getting out and meeting the public. And so that's kind of my way of indirectly campaigning. Well, Justice Sellers, best of luck on the campaign. Thank you. And thank you for coming on the show. Sure. This has been an episode of Success Stories. Our guest today was Justice Will Sellers of the Alabama Supreme Court. I'm Alan Mendenhall, signing off. Thanks for watching.